Hello, thanks for listening to the Total Knee Tips and Pearls podcast. This is Adam Rose and your host. I'm a fellowship trained orthopedic surgeon who specializes in joint replacement. In these episodes, I'm going to share with you a lot of my tips and tricks and review classic articles and current implant designs. Thanks for tuning in and on with the show. Hello and welcome back. This is Adam Rosen, and you're listening to the Total Knee Tips and Pearls podcast. So today's episode, I just want to try to clear up um, some confusion that I've heard from certain students um, or residents uh, or fellows when they're trying to understand or grasp the idea of anterior referencing and posterior referencing. Um, you know, knee, knees can get really confusing. You know, we talk about a total knee and you know, you start to talk about the different approaches, but then you talk about cruciate retaining, cruciate sacrificing, posterior stabilized, and then you start to get into measure resection, gap balancing, kinematic alignment, and then referencing. And, and it gets a little overwhelming because I think in the beginning, if you don't understand the lingo, sometimes it's, it's really overwhelming to try to piece together, you know, okay, down this particular path of this surgeon with this knee, like what system I, am I using? What poly am I using? How are they balancing? And for a lot of surgeons, um, they may have a very cookie cutter way, but for other people, like for me, I kind of use a little bit of everything. And, and that I think is an advantage if you understand um, those little things and you can make changes based on someone's anatomy or what you hear me talk about a lot of times is the personality of the knee. You know, we talk about the personality of a fracture, but I think when we're looking at an arthritic knee, who's going to have a knee replacement, there's definitely a personality to each knee and you have to take that into an account. You know, every varus knee is not a varus knee and every valgus knee is not a valgus knee. Um, but I think a lot of times people get overwhelmed at the terminology. Um, and more importantly, if you don't understand the terminology and you don't understand the steps and the mechanics, that's where you're a lot more likely to make a mistake and get somewhere where you're not really sure how to get out of the hole that you've created. Um, so anterior posterior, um, and, and I've done both, um, but predominantly now, um, I'm a posterior referencing. So, um, anterior referencing, just let's talk about basics, right? So anterior referencing, you're referencing off the front or the anterior aspect of the femur and posterior referencing, you're referencing off the back or the posterior aspect of the femur. So we just want to start there. Um, when you do an anterior referencing, um, different companies have different techniques and there's a few different ways to go about doing it. So typically, um, you'll use a stylus to mark out that anterior cortex and make your cut um, to be flush with the anterior cortex. And we've all seen these x-rays. So whether or not you use navigation anterior posterior referencing, we've all seen those x-rays where the implant looks totally flush with the cortex, where it looks like it's sitting high or anterior, and there's other times where it's notched. And sometimes it's flexed, and sometimes it's extended. So you have to understand that that femoral component position can occur with any of those techniques. Um, it all depends on how you use the technique and the operator. And I'm going to try not to go into a ton of detail because I think it's going to make this discussion more confusing. But again, with each of those things, we're also, um, when we talk about referencing, we have to talk about flexion extension. We have to talk about rotation, you know, whether or not you're using the epicondylar axis or white solids on it, poster condylar axis. So I'm not going to try to go too deep into that in this talk. But when we talk about anterior referencing, you can make a skim cut. So basically you can reference the front of the femur and you can make a skim cut. And then you can size off of that skim cut using the posterior condyles and the anterior skim cut because a lot of implant systems aren't necessarily cut at 90, right? So your distal femur and your anterior cortex aren't always cut at 90. And sometimes I think people are kind of amazed if they get into navigation and someone's talking about cutting in three degrees of flexion. Um, there are some instruments, if you're using IM, that have sort of a curved or bent rod that allows you to flex it. Um, some implants, you know, are, there's an anterior flange kicks up at three degrees or five degrees or seven degrees. So it's really important to kind of understand your implant, you know, and understand if I'm cutting more close to perpendicular, you know, what are the chances of me notching? Well, greater if you're in even a degree or two of extension. Whereas if you have an anterior flange that kicks up seven degrees, 
you know, you're less likely to notch. But also if you flex your component too much, the most proximal part of the femoral component could be sitting up high in the breeze. So you have to kind of keep all of those things in mind. So anterior referencing, we reference the cortex. You make a skim cut. You measure. You use your four-in-one cutting guide. And this way, you might take up an extra degree or two or take your chamfer. The benefits of the anterior referencing system is that you're most likely not going to notch. Again, operator dependent, anything can happen. But the idea there is that you're not measuring cutting and then the saw cut anteriorly is causing a notch. You're referencing off that anterior cortex. The other big kind of positive in a lot of people's minds is that if you're resecting um, bone off the front to be flush with the anterior cortex, you're less likely to overstuff the patellofemoral compartment. And again, that comes with a caveat. So we're making it flush. The question is how much bone or how thick was the bone in the trochlea and how much metal are you replacing? And did you resurface the patella? And if so, how much bone did you resect and how much did you add back with your poly? Because that's the true answer to whether or not you overstuffed the femoral compartment. Because if you do enough knees, what you'll notice is that you might be flush with the anterior cortex on a dozen knees. But in each individual, someone has a very thin trochlea and the bone's thin. Somebody has a thick trochlea. You might take 12 or 14 millimeters of bone, you know, and on some, it may be a sliver of three or four millimeters. So the question is, because each knee is different, um, I'm not a firm believer that just because you cut flush to the anterior cortex that you've referenced appropriately to restore the patellofemoral mechanics and have an overstuffed or understuffed that patellofemoral joint, but that becomes the key. So anterior referencing, reference off the, the anterior femur, the idea to prevent notching and then sizing. The next problem occurs is you have to understand the sizing of your femur though, because if you've cut yourself flush and let's say whatever size femur you've measured in the anterior posterior medial lateral plane, let's say your little um, tight inflection, or let's say even if you're balanced inflection, but you're oversized medial laterally, and maybe they don't have a narrow or even the narrow is wide and you need to downsize. You have to understand that every single time that you downsize your femoral component, if you're using the anterior referencing system, you're increasing your flexion gap space. So again, this comes down to the idea of the personality of the knee. So if you've referenced And let's say you have a large amount of posterior condylar offset, but the femur for whatever reason is narrow and you have to downsize your component, you really want to know, do my component sizes jump in 1.25 millimeters, one and a half millimeters, two millimeters, five millimeters? Because if the size difference in the anterior posterior space is small, you cutting a little bit more bone to downsize and you've only increased your flexion gap maybe a millimeter and a half, you know, that's doable, that's fixable. Whereas if it's a five millimeter jump, that's really increased your flexion gap, especially if it was well balanced. So now your problem is now you have to go back and resect more distal femur to balance your extension gap to your flexion gap. So you have to understand that going in that, okay, anterior referencing, I'm going to measure anterior cortex, I'm going to prevent myself from notching, Um, and then if I need to downsize, I'm going to be taking everything off the back. Posterior referencing. So posterior referencing, we're using some feet on the posterior condyles and you're measuring from the back of the knee. So, you know, what is the downside? Um, well, the downside is that if you measure too small and you make your anterior cut, you're more likely to notch. Um, what is the upside? So the posterior referencing upside is that if, you, especially if you're doing a measured resection, you're saying, okay, here's my posterior condyles medially and laterally. And I know that my implant thickness is X and I want to resect X so I can put my four in one cutting guide that I've measured in the holes and I can remove X off the posterior condyles to restore the posterior condylar height. Now, typically with most of the systems, you know, you're setting off the posterior condylar axis. 
So you have to understand, okay, where's white sides? Where's my epicondylar axis? Where's my three degrees of rotation? What am I measuring off of? Um, because if we get into where, and this becomes the big issue that people will always talk to you about with valgus knees and posterior lateral wear, that there is the potential or tendency if you're measuring off the posterior condyles to internally rotate your holes or internally rotate your positioning to internally rotate your four in one cutting guide. And that can have effects on the rest of the knee. Um, but again, I told you, I don't want to go down the hole of rotation on this topic, but we've measured the posterior aspect. Um, hopefully you're understanding the anatomy, the deformity, the personality of the knee, and you've set the appropriate rotation. And now we've made our cut. Okay. So maybe we're not flush with the anterior cortex and maybe we're a little wide. So now the beauty of this is I've measured my posterior condyles. I've balanced my flexion gap, but I'm a little wide and I haven't taken all the bone off the front of the femur. I'm not flush with the anterior cortex. I can downsize and it makes me narrower. I'm not overhanging. By downsizing, I haven't taken any more bone off the back because I'm using the regular holes or pins. And the only bone I'm going to take is off the front. And now I'm flush. And hopefully it's also balanced the patellofemoral joint mechanics and thickness of the trochlea and the thickness of the patella. But that's what's really helpful there. Now, it gets a little bit more confusing when we talk about anteriorizing and posteriorizing. Um, and that's really where I think this discussion um, came up with me recently. And it, it became this, I saw this confusion of, wait, we're talking anterior referencing, posterior referencing, anteriorizing and posteriorizing. Okay, so depending on the system that you're using, I think most total knee systems on the market now are one of either two systems. You either have two holes that you'll pin and on the four in one cutting guide, there's pegs and those pegs go into the holes. Um, or you put pins in through your sizer and the four in one cutting guide has um, holes that you can slide over those pins. So let's talk about that first. So if we say, let's cut for this four in one cutting guide for whatever size, and you have three holes, you have anterior holes, neutral holes, posterior holes, and you slide them over the holes that you pinned based on referencing off the posterior. Um, and then the next step, you've realized that we're wide, but we're balanced in flexion and you want to downsize. So if you're using a poster referencing system and you slide the next smallest size over that, that block or use your cutting guide, depending on which system you're using, you want to make sure that you're not cutting any more bone off the back of the femur. All the bone's going to come off the front. Whereas if you said my flexion gap was tight and maybe you've already, you know, you're already flush with the anterior cortex, so you don't want to take any more bone off the front because you're going to notch, but you're wide um, and you're tight. So we can downsize and you can anteriorize. So by anteriorizing your four in one cutting guide, now you're cutting really nothing, or you might take a little sliver off the anterior cortex. You're narrower, so you're not going to overhang. But now all the bone that you've taken is off the posterior condyles. So if your size difference is say one and a half, you've increased your flexion gap one and a half millimeters. You haven't notched. And now you're narrow enough that you're not going to stick out and impinge on your collaterals. So this is where it gets confusing. When we talk about referencing, we're talking about the beginning of the femoral preparation. Are you referencing off the anterior cortex to prevent notching, knowing that if you have to downsize, all of the bone is going to come off the posterior aspect of your femur, which is going to increase your flexion gap? Or are you balancing or referencing off the posterior condyles from the beginning of your femoral preparation, knowing that you have to watch to make sure that you're not going to notch? but you're taking an exact measurement off of the posterior condyles and you're also using your posterior condyles to set your rotation. So if there's a deformity, you need to modify the pinning or the block position to make sure that your rotation is correct with your other things that you're using, whether or not it's white sides of your epicondylar axis, um, or if you've cut your tibia, you know, using a gap checking technique. So that kind of hopefully answers, I hopefully I hope it doesn't confuse you more, um, but talks about the difference of anterior referencing, posterior referencing, um, and then the idea of anteriorizing and posteriorizing um, your femoral component. So understand kind of similar things, but two different things. You can anteriorize or posteriorize with any referencing, 
Um, but just most likely, if you've referenced off the front already and you try to drop your block back, you're going to notch. Um, whereas if you're poster referencing and you have thick bone and you're not flush with the cortex, you have the option of downsizing without um, notching. The most important thing at the end, though, is understanding all of the aspects of balancing so then you can make the appropriate assessments based on, again, the personality of the knee. Because if you see someone that has a really thick trochlea, you may not necessarily want that flush to the anterior cortex because you may have laxity in the patellofemoral kinematics. Whereas if someone has a huge amount of posterior condylar offset and you anterior reference and they're wide and you have to downsize you've now resected a lot of bone off the posterior condyles, you might increase or cause instability in flexion in that patient. So this is where the preoperative preparation and templating all comes in handy. Um, so hopefully, again, hopefully, um, this answers some of the questions and didn't cause more confusion. But again, if you have questions, please you know shoot me an email, let me know. I'm happy to do other talks on specific topics that you have. I'm working currently on these next two episodes um, that I want you to be aware of because for some of the fellows um, or people in practice or even upper level residents, it may seem a little boring. Um, I think it's still going to become worthwhile information. It may be great for your medical students, um, interns, and PGY ones and twos, but the group that I'm really aiming this at, um, because I, like a lot of people, you know, sometimes we have difficulties in the patients that get referred without what we see is a very simple algorithmic workup or treatment plan. So I've given these lectures um, in the past and I've done lectures for primary cares on multiple occasions. And I actually even have a little primer on knees that I actually give out to um, primary care doctors and basically goes through, these are all the things that we're thinking about for your routine knee pain consult. These are the workups. These are the treatments. These are the plans. This is the steps. This is when you order an MRI, which is rare. And this is when you refer on to ortho. Um, but what I'm going to try to do is do that in a podcast form. So I'm really hoping to explain it in a way that a primary care um, doctor um, understands. So if you have students that are not going into ortho, that are going to primary care, share this with them. You know, if you have residents in your program that are not in ortho, but part of your institution, again, this may be something that I would recommend that you share with them because it may help the medicine resident, internal medicine resident, uh, emergency room resident, have a very good understanding of here's an algorithm approach of how I diagnose, work up, what tests do I order, how do I treat, and when do I refer for knee pain in the outpatient setting. And then I'm also going to do a spinoff of that for the in-hospital consultation. You know, and when do you order tests? When do you withhold antibiotics? You know, when do you call ortho? You know, what is emergent? What's non-emergent? Um, just to kind of give them an understanding of what we expect um, and what makes the patient's care better and more efficient if they can do the appropriate workup and the appropriate test before they call us. So when we go, we have all the information in front of us to accurately diagnose um, and then work up and then treat the patient. So look for that in the next few weeks. And it may be something very worthwhile, I think, for you to listen to. But I think even more, and my goal is even more important for you to then share with your non-orthopedic colleagues um, so they have a very good, clear, concise understanding of how to take care of those patients when they hit their office or their, their inpatient consultation. So in the meantime, um, stay safe. Uh, I will talk to you next week. I uh, hope you enjoyed what you've heard today. Thanks again for listening. And if you have colleagues that haven't listened to the podcast and you think it would be uh, beneficial for them, uh, please shoot them a link. I'm Adam Rosen. You've been listening to the Total Need Tips and Pearls podcast. You've been listening to the Total Need Tips and Pearls podcast. Make sure that you're subscribed so you'll be notified of future episodes. And please take the time to leave a review. It helps other people like you find the show. Until next time, stay safe.